you know, I always forget. All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to get started. We have the pleasure and the honor of uh, being joined today by Rod Hicks. Rod is the Director of Ethics and Diversity at the Society uh, of Professional Journalists. And Rod's been there now um, a couple years, not in that role, but at the Society, a couple years. Yeah, almost three. Uh, yeah, and has had uh, journalism positions, um, various positions, various publications around the country um, as a reporter, as a manager. Um, I thought I tried to make him a, a, a Dow Jones alumni, but I found out when I talked to him that we've been mistaking him for somebody else um, and he did not attend our program, but we won't hold that against him. Um, he is somebody who's very well known in the industry um, and you know, I first uh, got to know him through the National Association of Black Journalists, where his name just kept coming up. And at every convention, I would hear that he was on some panel or he was doing this, doing that. And so um, I am, I reached out to him, not knowing if he would agree and uh, knowing that he's a very busy guy and he agreed to come and speak and share with you all um, some things that you need to know as you enter the workforce in this 21st century about ethics. And you know, that's a hot topic now in the news, um, ethics or the lack thereof. And so I didn't give him a whole lot of instruction about what to talk about, but I think that um, we both agree that we want it to be a, a discussion rather than him lecturing. And we hope that um, you'll get as much from it as I think you will. And so Rod, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You let me know what you need from me and uh, Heather and we'll, we're here to assist. Oh, uh, thank you, Shirley. And of course, I'm happy to uh, be here and to talk to uh, students in journalism because this is the only profession I know and it's something that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, so, I know that for many of you, it's late in the day, uh, but the thing that I promise you is that we're gonna have a, a good discussion and, and we're gonna have fun. Uh, and when I say discussion, that means I'm going to talk and I'm going to answer your questions. You're gonna talk to me and you're going to ask me questions. So at any point, I want you to feel comfortable enough to just interrupt me, you know, you know, I, I, I'll find my place or, you know, maybe it's time for the conversation to shift. So if you have any questions, I do encourage you to ask them immediately. Um, I don't know the, Shirley, what, what's the method for them to ask questions? Should, is there a feature for them to raise hands or should they write in the chat or? Yeah, um, either one, you can raise your hand and we'll be on the lookout, or you can just put your question in the chat and we'll uh, bring it to Rod's attention. Okay, so I'm gonna speak today about trust in the media generally, and then we're gonna talk more specifically about two aspects of that, uh, one being ethics and the other being uh, inclusivity, because I think that both of these are areas where we really need to up our game today. Um, the industry, I, I joined this industry in 1980, um, uh, before many of you were born, I'm sure. Uh, and I've been in it you know, ever since in various roles. Um, and it's changed a lot since I got here. And it's unfortunate that you, you haven't been in it so much because it's really been an, an interesting ride. When I joined the industry, uh, there was no widespread internet. It was just becoming a thing when I, uh, when I joined the industry. There absolutely was no social media. Uh, there was no Google. Uh, when I was a reporter, I made friends with somebody at the library 
And whenever I needed something to be looked up or to have some more details, I would call on this guy and say, hey, I need this. That, he was my Google. Um, it's hard to imagine that today. Um, and the other thing that was different about that time is that people generally trusted the news that they received. Um, and it, it came from local TV stations of which there were three or four in most markets, including where I grew up. Um, and then while I was in college, uh, CNN came onto the air providing 24 hour coverage. They were the only one doing that. So unlike today where you have many options to see 24 hour news, that wasn't the case. And the thing that was so interesting is that you had, if you want to know the news, you needed to get home or be home around uh, 6 or 6.30. You can catch your local news and then the national news. But you had to be there to catch it, you know? Uh, there was, unless it was something really big uh, that they broke into TV programming, you got everything at 6 or 6.30, right? If you were a newspaper subscriber, you would get up in the morning, usually, and around five or six o'clock, you go and to your front door and right outside there's the newspaper and you can find out everything interesting that happened yesterday, right? There was no, you know, immediacy through all, all media at that time. So we have e evolved a long way. Um, right now, something happens, people find out about it right away. Um, either through news accounts, through their own social media or news sites or whatever. They have many means, many platforms uh, from which to get news out immediately. Or it may be from somebody else. It may be from somebody who just picks up their cell phone and start uh, recording something live on Facebook or Instagram. And, and, and some people have amassed these huge audiences, so much so, so that there are people who have audiences on YouTube that are bigger than the circulation of my first newspaper, much bigger, right? And so now that everybody has the ability to, to get information out to a large number of people, um, they may be tempted to call themselves journalists, but there's a big difference between what they do and what we do as journalists. And the biggest difference is that the information that we put out, we verify it. We base what we say on evidence. Um, there's no, for a person who is just talking to their audience, uh, some of it may be made up, some may be hearsay, some may be propaganda. Um, and some may just be uninformed opinion that just gets passed around and around. This is where we have landed in 2021, much different than 1980. And here's the problem. The audience, the people that we're trying to get this information to, they, they don't, they can't discern between what's credible and what's not credible. You may find this hard to believe, but they don't make any meaningful distinction between some person who picks up their camera, their cell phone and start record recording something or somebody who has a blog just um, giving out their opinion. They don't make a, they don't distinguish between that and that and news that might come from, you know, a TV network or your local news station or your local newspaper. They don't make a difference. Because media has all converged, it's all in the same place anyway. All media is on social media. All media have websites and they post on multiple platforms. So your, you know, story that you have gone through great pains to, to, to verify and based on evidence, it's right next to something that somebody made up or it's right next to some, something that somebody posted and they got half of the information wrong. And people see all this in the same place and to them, it's all the media. When people say that they don't trust the media, I'm fully convinced that 
uh, they're mostly not talking about the news media because there's so much out there that they conflate with news. Um, and, you know, like I said, it might be propaganda, it might be commentary, it may be advertising, it may be satire, it's, but they call it the media. How do you fight that? How do you get your information that has been verified in front of people and more importantly, get them to believe it? Um, what, what happens, what has happened today um, post Donald Trump, or it actually started before he took office, this term fake news became a thing. Um, I really hate that term because of how it's used. Uh, first of all, news by definition is not fake. If it's something that's fake, then it is not news. So there's a problem there with that, with that term. But then in the way that it's used, people just say, call stuff fake news, even if nobody is claiming that it's news. If uh, you may go to, to a, um, I don't know, a city councilman and say, hey, um, I hear you're gonna, you're gonna not vote on this ordinance. And they yell, fake news. I'm like, well, what? there's no news. This is what somebody in your office told me. And they just say fake news, you know. It's 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 a horrible term, and I try not to use it. Um, two years ago, um, shortly after I got this job at SPJ, um, my first role was a position called journalist on call, and my job was to try to understand why people distrust the news and to see if there were any things that I could suggest to the industry to try to help combat it. Um, I went to Wyoming, Casper, Wyoming. It's the second largest city, uh, even though it only had like 60,000 people. But the entire state has a population of, um, I think a half million people. So it's vast land, few people. Uh, but this is a place that I chose because I was looking for a place where people um, where people didn't trust the news because those were the people I wanted to talk to to understand it. And in Wyoming, uh, one of the things that I used as a barometer was their support of Donald Trump who, as you know, used that term fake news, said the media makes up stuff, makes up sources um, with an enemy of the state and all of that. Uh, and he has a lot of followers. Well, I think there are 23 counties in uh, Wyoming and 18 of them voted for Trump with more than 70% of the vote. Uh, he won all but one, but you know, in most of them, he won with you know huge huge majorities and so also uh gallup said that that wyoming had the greatest um number of people who the greatest share of people who distrust the, the news so i went there to, to to talk to them and i'm going to just play for you a summary of uh that project and, and then we'll talk about some of the issues that came out, out of that. Uh, let me see if I can find it, if you can hold on just for a moment. It is. I've worked in journalism for more than 40 years, and it's distressing that public trust in news organization is declining. It's what you don't report. It's when the stories are... It's when the stories are positive towards uh, conservative ideas, they get buried or they get ignored. We're so tied up in these sensational gotcha issues, and we're not paying attention to real matters. The media is so um, intent on being the first person to have the story out that 
accuracy and um, verification gets pushed to the wayside. The Society of Professional Journalists recognized eroding trust in journalism and hired a journalist on call to create a pilot project that would deal with trust issues head on. I'm Rod Hicks. I'm a journalist on call for the Society of Professional Journalists. And I put together this project in Casper. For six months, the Society of Professional Journalists held focus group style meetings to explore issues surrounding trust in journalism. The project was called Media Trust and Democracy, the Casper Project. The thing that we wanted to do is really dig deep and try to understand why people don't trust the news that they get. SPJ wanted the project to be in a community where there are low levels of trust for news media. The goal was twofold, to learn more about why people distrust news reporting and to see if discussions and interactions with journalism professionals would lead to increased trust. SPJ journalist on call Rod Hicks chose Casper, Wyoming as the site for the project. Gallup found the greatest distrust in Republican leaning states with small populations of color and Wyoming was at the top of its list. Wyoming has the highest level of media distrust in the country. And two, because it is a uh, Trump country, and Trump, as you know, tells the American people that they can't trust the media. Talk about bias. Three dozen Casper residents met regularly to ask questions and express their concerns. I do not trust the press, but that doesn't mean that I don't read and listen and watch every day. I would have conversations with the Casper Star Tribune uh, and, they, and the publisher about some of the some of the reporting that I thought was biased, and he introduced me to Rod in this program. At the Washington Post, we come from all different places. Each of five SPJ sessions had a different focus. The first was trust, what erodes and what can strengthen it. The second, distinguishing what's news and what's not. Third, recognizing bias. And the last two were discussions with local then national journalists. Participants also toured local television and newspaper newsrooms. Let us explain to you how we do our jobs and why we do things the way that we do and what efforts we go through to verify information and to make sure our stories are fair, make sure our stories are accurate. I think the media can help people understand that they have a watchdog job. And so since we're functioning as a watchdog, this is why we cover this. I think giving people some why information because that's the most powerful question, is why. When you watch news, you want to know what happened in the world today. And 60% of it is what Mr. Trump said or what somebody said to him in return. Casper residents complained of inaccuracies, overlooked stories, biased liberal perspectives, and biased perspectives of middle-aged white men. Exploring tough topics of trust, bias, and fairness were revealing and at times led to uncomfortable moments. Like at the final session, it was open to the public and an audience member yelled obscenities at a panelist over comments he made about President Trump. Given his long history, that it is extremely accurate to call those tweets racist. No, no, no. I'm, I, let me explain, let me explain. No, no. So if you look through no. one of the first- He's entitled to-, to, to No, no, no. Excuse look, me a moment. Yeah. We're, all in, we're all in here to learn. I heard you racist. All that, right. Okay, Oleta. Tonight, we heard some pretty sharp words about who are you to tell us what the truth is? They say that they don't want the news bias, yet they listen to bias news networks. They say that they believe that 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 the press is important in a democracy, yet they don't trust the press. So we're trying to make sense of all of this. 36 Casper residents agreed to discuss their news media trust issues and learn more about how journalism works and the challenges reporters and their news organizations face. Some did not make every session. 11 attended them all. One quit midstream, citing presenter's bias. He said that the presenter uh, just wanted to tell him what to think and wanted him to think his way and, and that he was rigid. 
which is not what I saw. And, and, he, and he just quit the project. So some people are just not reachable. How can the media regain your confidence in that? And I say by holding each other accountable. An educated or enlightened public is essential to a democracy. And I believe in a democracy. So I'm going to trust media. I want to trust the media. I uh, graduated from the University of Wyoming with a degree in journalism. I believe and trust the media. And what I'm seeing is an education to give me a foundation. Not under the impression by any stretch of the imagination that we have an easy task ahead. There are so many people who feel strongly in so many different ways. We just have to do something and we have to do the best that we can. We have been putting this project, um, pursuing this project in the hope that if uh, you have, if you have a better sense of what it is we do, um, we are less likely to be viewed as your enemy than as your servant, which is the way broadcast journalists and print journalists see themselves. The most challenging thing for me was trying to figure out how what I was hearing in these sessions could be translated into something actionable that would bring the people with the issues back to journalism. The Casper Project wrapped with some recommendations. Seek out and identify bias in a story before publishing it. Be transparent about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Engage your audience. Teach people about journalism jobs and the process and combine the last two recommendations to create your own Casper Project. Um, where was there? That was uh, two years ago. Um, and you know, since two years, there's been there's, there have been some areas that have gotten really worse. And I'm not trying to scare you away from this industry. We need people who are well ready to go in. But this project raised a lot of the issues that you have in journalism. Bias is perceived to be one of the biggest problems. Um, uh, but the thing that's happened since then, um, well, one is the proliferation of misinformation, and disinformation campaigns, and 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 the tools that are available to make content look real. That is a big issue. Um, this is just one other thing to to throw in there to make to make the job of journalists even harder. The other is the 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 willingness the shameless willingness of some public officials to just outright lie no innuendo just just lying a willingness to dispute reality and to to go on a friendly news network and repeat a lie with a straight face knowing that many people are going to believe it uh one example Tucker carson was sued for slander a few years ago by karen mcdougall uh she had claimed to have had an affair with Donald Trump. Uh, Tucker Carlson's defense was, you can't believe the bullshit that I say on the air. That was his actual defense. Really, look that up. That was his argument in this lawsuit. You can't believe what, what I say, you know, and nobody, there's no expectation that I'm saying anything truthful. And he won that case, believe it or not. And the, prob the problem is that people do believe him uh, and they believe uh, Donald Trump. So there's an alternate reality out there that many people believe. You're trying to tell them as journalists the truth based on evidence and they don't believe you, but they do believe the guy who says that you shouldn't believe me. Um, I want to stop right now. Um, we've uh, dug kind of, you know, fairly deeply into the issue of, of trust and some of the other the issues that are going to um, uh, disrupt your lives as journalists. So I want to see, I want to give people at this point to ask any questions about what we've said so far before we go on. So does anybody have any questions? Hmm. 
I was told that there would be a lot of questions asked of me. Uh, I, I have a question. I don't know if you could see people. People are raising their hands. Oh, no, I, I can't see people. I can see you now. What's your question? <laughs> Hi. I was just wondering if the Society of Professional Journalists had any specific recommendations for how to eliminate bias. Because honestly, I've heard a lot from a lot of different professors. Like a lot of different um, kind of suggestions and takes. Yeah. Like the, the, the thing that we tell journalists is to be aware that there might be a possibility that that what you say may sound biased and to check yourself. You know, it's, you know, as, as editors, we try to backstop things like that because when people get too close to a subject, um, they may unintentionally put something in that shows a bias. And so editors can be one one area to stop that but it really is incumbent on the reporter to to just ask yourself let me just read this read back what i'm about to put out there for people to see and ask could it be perceived as as a bias and often you might catch something even if you don't even if you think that if you have any inkling that there could be the perception that this comment or this description of this adjective um, uh, convey a bias, then change it. But you really should be a check on yourself. Is that music coming from me? That was nice. Anything else? And I cannot see hands, so. I've got a question I can go Sorry, I, I'll, I'm sorry, Rod. I'll call, uh, who was, uh, Megan? Yeah, I was wondering, the video mentioned some tips, but what overall tip would you have for journalists about ways that they as an individual can work to gain the trust of their readers or have a better trust with readers? One of the things that I want to show through what I've said to you so far and through that video is how this is not an easy thing. I hope that came across. Um, it is very difficult to win back trust. There were years went into uh, tearing down the trust of journalists and it's not gonna go away quickly. Um, and it has uh, worsened in the last five years since we had a president who was saying, you can't trust the press. Um, one of the things that you really should try to do it's almost unfair, unfair for, for me or anybody to ask you to do this, but be perfect or as close as you can be in your reporting. Because every time you make a mistake, there will be people who will use that as an example of bias. So you have to be especially careful, you know, there need to be systems in place to help you catch errors, to help the people who do the backstop and catch errors, because mistakes are very, very damaging. We're going to talk more about ethics um, uh, uh, in a bit, but you have to perform your job with the highest ethical standards. Because once again, if any little thing that can be perceived as being unethical, helps um, helps um, deteriorate the credibility of the press. So you just have to try really hard. Now, the other thing you can do though, is try to build relationships one-on-one, -on -one. create some ambassadors. Everybody you interview, everybody you talk to is a potential ambassador to say, hey, you know what? That reporter was pretty fair. So be fair with that report, I mean, with that source and create as many people out there who can who view journalism as positive. One of the things that um, I wanted people to see in the Casper project, particularly when they got to tour some newsrooms and when they heard, when they got to ask questions one-on-one -on -one with the local journalists and then the national journalists is that we go through a lot of work to try to make sure what we have is true and correct. We don't want to make any mistakes and we try very hard, you know? So 
I hope that came through to this group, but one-on-one, um, -on -one, just try to build relationships with so your sources so that they trust you and they say, you know, I was wrong about journalism. Uh, they do try to get it right. But as I've presented to you so far, uh, that's an uphill challenge right there. Abigail? Yeah, I was just wondering if you plan on doing like a project like this again in a couple of years once you maybe see if it's either worsened based on, I don't know, Facebook restrictions or something uh, like just like politics that are happening or if this was kind of a one-time project. When we went into this, we didn't know if we would do it again or not, but the idea of doing it again in a different community was always out there. Um, we've moved, for now, we've moved on past there, that, because there are so many issues, as you, you know, can see that are worth uh, delving into. And so right now, my focus is on ethics and it's also on diversity. Um, and that's the inclusivity that I mentioned early on. So it's possible that we would go back and try to do this or something similar to try to gauge um, um, what people are thinking about the press, but it's not something that, um, you know, that, that's gonna happen anytime soon. We did say though, in our project, we encouraged local um, you know, news organizations to try doing this. That was one of our recommendations to try to gauge your own community to see where trust is there and to get feedback from the audience to see what the people who, you know, who view the, the journalism that you produce to, uh, to see what they feel that you can do better to um, in your trust. Amari? Um, hi, I just had a quick question about like how maybe the society of professional journalists or how the industry is defining bias now. Um, I just think a lot about like some of the events that happened over the summer with different um, black reporters being taken off of reporting on the protests or now Asian American reporters are experiencing similar things. Um, and also I watch the Vox missing chapter series. And so that entire series is based on um, like taking a current event and tying it back historically. And typically when those episodes cover like issues of bias or discrimination or anything in our country's history that points to like racism or sexism or anything like that, those episodes are always like inundated with comments about how this is like liberal or biased or, you know, like anti-white, anti-men. So like, what does the industry consider to be biased um, and how can we how can we avoid that while still telling the truth about like this country and its history and the things that are currently happening here? Um, unfortunately, how journalists define bias is less important than how um, news consumers define it. And they're all over the map. Uh, one more thing that makes our, our jobs difficult. Um, the the SPJ code of, code of ethics uh, outlines some things that you can try to do to rein in that. And I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, just Google S SPJ code of ethics. And it's, uh, it's a correct, you know, it has like 35 bullet points on the, three, on the four um, uh, basic principles. Um, that's a good guide, but people's tastes change, so and, and their their view changes. One of the things about human beings is that they want what they see as reality to be reflected in the news coverage. What they see as reality may not be actual reality. This became clear in, in Casper. Um, people in this group said that uh, coverage of Donald Trump was 
biased that the press did not like Donald Trump. And so they wrote all these negative stories about him. They did not entertain the idea that Donald Trump did a lot of things that were negative. Therefore, you know, you can characterize a lot of the coverage as negative. They also didn't consider that the coverage of some of these so-called, in some of these so-called negative stories could be fair to the president because a story that is perceived to be negative can still be fair. You know, if you gave the person who looks bad in story an opportunity to defend him or herself, if you verified all of the information, if you didn't inject any uh, uh, unfair um, context, you know, there, the, so the story could be very fair, even though it's not, the, the, it doesn't, you know, reflect positively on the president. The, the short answer to, to your question is that um, we have to just do the best that we can in sorting through the various definitions that the public have uh, come up with to define bias. But one of the things that I pointed out to the people in Casper is that the bias is not just on one side. You bring, as a news consumer, a bias to the story that you you read or you view. It's not just, you know, you, you already have some ideas about, you know, the story before you even read anything. And so if what you read doesn't um, match what you already believe, then you might think that story is biased even though what you already believe may not be true. Sorry, that's the, that's the, the best that I can you know, answer that question. Thank you. Uh, Jen? Uh, yes, hi. Um, thank you for talking to us, to us tonight. Um, so I guess my question was, you kind of talk, uh, touched on it, but um, I think journalists do have an important role in being objective and trustworthy when reporting, but I feel like it takes two to tango. Um, and like, I feel like you said, most news consumers also bring their own bias into when they read a news story. Um, so what do you think is the role of media literacy in all of this? And is there anything that can be done in our end to fix it? Or is it more of an issue in general that we just have to work with? Well, I'm glad that you brought up that. Uh, the issue of media literacy. That is something that I feel very strongly about. Um, already there are some um, um, schools at each level, uh, elementary schools and some colleges, and I believe high schools as well, that are doing courses on media literacy. You know, when I laid, to, laid out for you how complicated this landscape is, you got all this information that's coming to you and it's coming from a lot of different sources, but it's all there on the same platform, you know, advertising next to uh, journalism, next to propaganda, and next to more propaganda, next to misinformation, next to something that's a part of a disinformation campaign. All of that comes together on Twitter, on Facebook, you know, on Instagram, you know, all there together. And how do, how would a, um, just a, regular news consumer know how to sort through all of that because the people who push some of this the the disinformation campaigns they make it look real they make it look like it could have come from a legitimate news source right uh, so there's all this information masquerading as news and a, a regular person might have trouble trying to figure and i've had people tell me that there was this guy you know educated guy he was um He's, um, uh, I think it was a, a priest. And he's like, you know, I read a lot and, you know, I have two college degrees and sometimes I don't know what to trust. One of the things that I didn't mention is that the, to further complicate things is that you have, you have uh, media that caters to um, a particular ideology, you know, 
many news, most local news organizations try to uh, be fair and, and, and as objective as they possibly can be. But you have places like, um, like uh, Fox News, you can go there if you want to hear um, stories that are, um, if you want to hear attacks on liberals or Democrats, if you want to hear something, attacks on Donald Trump or Republicans or conservative ideas, you go to MSNBC. And there's a lot of talk radio out there that caters to different ideology. I think that this is a bad trend. trend. It makes it worse. I mean, the way that you can just go pick out your news source like, you know, pizza toppings is just bad for, I think, democracy. You know, I think I think what's best for democracy is for news organizations to just try their best to be as objective and unbiased as possible and not you know, lean toward one ideology or the other. But we're beyond that. So we have to deal with the reality. What we can do is try to teach people the difference. How do you, how can you, what are the uh, characteristics of a news organization that is credible, right? What should I be looking for? And how do I tell the difference between propaganda and news? You know, I mean, th these are the kind of things that can be taught and should be taught in media literacy uh, uh, classes. And I really hope that this catches on and it becomes a big part of, um, um, you know, of educating kids from early ages through, through college so they can be uh, better equipped to sort through all of this mess. Olivia. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how to eliminate bias in choosing stories? Because I, I personally find that that's difficult for me. And also I noticed that someone in the, the Casper video was saying like, it's not what you do report, it's what you don't report on. Uh, is there any suggestions from the Society of Professional Journalists for that? Um, yeah, there were a couple of people who brought that up during the uh, Casper session. Um, you, you know, everything can't fit in, you know, a 26 and a half minute broadcast or, you know, or a, you know, or your daily newspaper. Everything that happens can't fit. So you have to make some choices and, you know, making those choices inherently will show your biases. That's one of the things that's hard to get around, get around. But what you should try to do, I believe, is to sort of do an audit of what you're covering and what you're not covering uh, occasionally and see where the gaps are. One of the things that the uh, video suggested is that you have interactions with the people in the community. Let them tell you what the gaps are. Um, and and you know you you go and respond to what the readers are telling you you're not covering. So those are a couple of things that that you can do, but you just have to be mindful that this is going to be difficult. Uh, the other thing, while you have those people there, help educate them because um, people talked about how in this group they talked about how a story on Fox News would get barely any play on MSNBC. Um, that could be said also um, for MSNBC uh, having stories that barely get any mention on Fox. Part of the thing that's wrong with that whole debate is that you're using MSNBC and Fox News as examples. Let's look at uh, news organizations that don't cater to a particular ideology, all right? Now, you still are going to have some differences, but one of the things about this business and one of the things that, um, you know, excites some people as they move up in management is that they get to set the news agenda. They get to decide what is the most important thing that I should let my community know today. And that's why it's going to be different from place to place because, right, 
Everybody's going to have a story about the election, every front page all over the country, right? But there was something that happened in your local community that may have been so big that the national election gets less play than this big thing that happened in your community, you know? So community by community, there are going to be different things that are going to be um, um, newsworthy or, or the you know, the, you know, the level of newsworthiness on a given day and a story that, you know, you know, well, let me just give you this example. When I was in St. Louis, my job was to uh, make sure that everything that went on the front page was perfect. Everything, stories, headlines, photographs, graphics, you know, the little things at the top that tells you what's inside, the price, everything on the front page had to be perfect, right? And the, the, the team earlier in the day would decide what goes on the front page. But then at night, when I was there, something happens that we're covering. And it was up to me to decide, all right, is this story bigger than the five or six stories that a whole bunch of editors uh, have thought about and decided were worthy to go on the front page? And I would have to use my judgment to figure out, one, does this new story, is it big enough? And is it as important for our community, St. Louis and St. Louis area to give more prominence than something that's already on the front page? And then I have to decide what to take off of the front page to put this new story on the front page, right? And so you have, this happens every day. And that's what, what you're trying to do is give your community the best mix of stories um, that are available on any given day uh, that might resonate with them, impact their lives, or be important to them. And that is just a judgment call. That's also uh, why diversity is so important. Because exactly. when you have a diversity of people making those decisions, you get different kinds of stories coming up, right? That is. Uh-uh. Did we lose Rod? Can't hear you, Rod. I think I broke it. Rod, can you hear us? Wave your hand. All right, well, I think hopefully he'll be able to come back in. Um, I had, I got knocked offline earlier and I thought I knocked everything off because the Zoom was on my computer, <laughs> the Zoom call. But luckily you all were able to keep going um, and I, get, I finally got back in. Um, hopefully Rod can do the same. But while we're waiting for him to come back, um, you know, the, the whole debate about objectivity has to do with whose object, who's objectivity, right? Um, and so that, that to me is one of the, the more interesting um, developments in the media, in journalism, in this uh, post-COVID world, where I guess we're still in COVID. Um, let me see if I can send him an email and ask him to, re to try to go out and come back in. Or maybe, Any other thoughts while we're waiting for Rod? Any of the other uh, training instructors want to weigh in? Paige? Yeah, uh, one person from the Casper project that stood out was the uh, woman presenting uh, person who 
said that she was a journalist and she's like, I want to trust the media. And I was like, oh my goodness. And so I would love to hear more about her take um, participating in this, especially working in a more conservative climate. And I mean, knowing what she learned and then talking with other journalists for this project, she stood out. I was like, I want more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's trying to get back in. Um, Rod? See me, I'm back. Okay, great. There you are. Hey, my internet just <laughs> went out. I had that I same what... thing. It yeah. might be something spreading across the country. Where are you? I'm in New Jersey. Okay, I'm in DC, so I don't yeah. know. Anyway, we so, were just talking about, um, Paige was just saying she wanted to hear more from the woman who said, I want to trust the media. Yeah. <laughs> in the... Yeah. She was the youngest member of, our, of that group. She was in her um, early 20s. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually using my uh, cell phone here to talk to you guys. So uh, what I was about to suggest is that we take a break um, and then we come back. Is there any... Uh, any objections to that? No, you want to do uh, 10 minutes? Yeah, uh, right. let's come back in 10 minutes and I'm gonna, you know, I've, yeah, I've checked. Both of my computers are saying that there's no uh, Wi-Fi, so. <laughs> all right, well, hopefully you'll be able to get through like I was, but um, all right, so get, we'll be back here um, by 10 after, let's just, say 10 after. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. See you guys. Right. In... Okay. Thanks. Shirley, are you still there? Yep. I have to go run out and pick my son up from daycare, but I'll be back hopefully in like 15 in case. Okay. All right. Hopefully I'm, I'm good now. So I should be able to let people in if they get knocked off. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll be back. All right.
I see you, Bradley. Thank you. Now, I've, this is the bad time of the day for this location, but it'll be fixed in five minutes. Yeah. If I can help you with hand raisings or anything like that, let me know. Okay. Yeah, I hope Rod is able to get back in. I don't see him. But yeah, I was scrambling trying to get my internet back up. Um, it looks like we're getting ready to get a storm here. Who knows? Oh, now somebody's calling me and I don't know who it is. <laughs> Technology is both a blessing and a curse, isn't it? It definitely is. Half of our, I'm gonna spend the second half of our, um, discussion here talking about uh, inclusive journalism and more on, on ethics. Um, let me say first that, uh, as we've hinted at, the press has been accused of being liberal. Now, I do agree that journalists are most likely to be Democrat and they're most likely to be uh, liberal leaning. But I also believe that it's the industry that attracts people like this because of the mission of news serving, serving as, the, uh, as a government watchdog. You know, journalists want to help people. They want to point out things that the government is not doing or not doing adequately to protect their, their citizens. Um, and you know, people are people. You are who you are. And everybody should have an opportunity to work in this profession. And nobody comes without any... Um, without holding any opinion or, or having any uh, ideology. Um, that said, I do believe too that conservative viewpoints are difficult to find in the mainstream press. That was a big complaint in Casper and I think there's some merit to that. That's another thing that we need to, to work on as, as an industry. You know, think about how um, your conservative um, viewers and listeners and readers will uh, feel about the stories that you've selected, the stories that you've admitted, and how you present the stories that you do um, uh, produce and put out for the public. And that's actually an area that I, I think that we need to, um, we need to, as an industry, uh, focus on more in, in, the, uh, in the coming years. Um, so the conservatives, conservative people are often the big critics of the press, but also uh, the press is criticized from other groups, some liberal, uh, liberal groups, and then they get cr criticized for how they report and who they choose to report on. Um, People from communities of color traditionally have been underrepresented in, in, in the news. And in some coverage, the coverage has been just absolutely abysmal. And, it's, and sometimes it was based on negative stereotypes. Uh, and some, some was even racist. There have been some news organizations who, that have admitted that their coverage in race. The Kansas City Star did um, an entire project um, admitting that some of their coverage in the 50s and 60s and, and as you know, as the latest in 1990s was racist. And National Geographic, the magazine with the yellow border has also done this recently and there've been others. Um, and there is right now uh, this renewed interest, maybe that's saying it too strongly, but there's a, an effort by many news organizations to try to be more inclusive in their coverage. Back in the late 1960s, there were um, several riots that broke out across the country. And Lyndon Johnson was president at the time and he formed a, a commission to see what was going on and why black Americans were rioting. Uh, this commission was called the Kerner Commission. Uh, the commission's report talked about how black people lived in squalor, didn't have the same opportunities as whites, 
to improve their lives. And there were policies and sometimes even laws that held back black people. Uh, the port uh, went, went much further than what the president had in mind. Uh, in fact, I don't think that President Johnson ever, uh, well, he never endorsed the findings of the Kerner Commission. Um, but this report, although it was, its focus was on, although its focus was on what caused the, uh, the riots, it also included a section on the role that the press played in creating and maintaining uh, Black Americans in a, in a disadvantaged uh, position. It talks about how Black people were portrayed in the, in the press, which at that time had virtually all white staffs. There was very little of any coverage of just regular daily life of Black people. And what was reported was shallow and sometimes it was racist. And, and, that's, um, and that's what was being fed to the majority of the uh, population. Back then, newspapers were doing pretty good in terms of circulation and TV was uh, growing in popular popularity. Uh, so this was the representation, your TV, local TV news and national TV news and the newspaper. This is what shaped how um, white America and well, everybody else blue view black life and black people was how it was reported in the press. Um, there were no stories of success, just a lot of crime and a lot of poverty. So um, the Kerner Commission said that there was not a realistic depiction of everyday life and the struggles that black people endured mainly because of white supremacy that was embedded in the rules and also policies and laws and traditions. And so the commission said that one of the reasons that black people were covered so poorly was because there weren't any black people on the, on the staffs of these news organizations. And it said that they needed to hire black people. It recommended that they hire more black people as reporters and put some in management positions with the idea that this would um, increase uh, the amount of coverage and the quality of coverage of uh, African Americans. Now, this also applies for uh, other people of color. It wasn't just black people. And a recent example of that is back in March when there were, I mean, it was like um, eight people were killed in Atlanta. Some were at some spas in Atlanta and six of them were Asian women. And what this revealed was that some news organizations were slow to tell the story in a, in, in a textured way uh, because they weren't used to covering Asian communities and they didn't, they didn't have anybody to speak the languages. Uh, so this is not something that has gone away. What the Kerner, uh, you know, the Kerner Commission back in 1968 suggested hiring more diverse staffs. And then 10 years later, about 10 years later, the American Society of Newspaper Editors uh, did the same. They said, okay, as an industry, we are going to set a goal of, bring, of, of, of bringing the racial and ethnic diversity of newsrooms, it, since it was a newspaper organization, it was of newspapers uh, to match the racial and ethnic diversity of the country. And they set this goal for 2020, I'm sorry, for 2000. And guess what? They failed. It wasn't even close. And, and in fact, we, it looks like we were going backwards. They've set a new target of 2025. What I'm ur urging you to do as journalists is um, help bring this to life. You know, we do need uh, more people of color in newsrooms, and we do need uh, coverage of communities of color that's nuanced and that's textured and that really reflects the lives that are lived in these communities. And it does help, it helps tremendously when you have uh, people from those communities on your staffs. So, I'm just hoping that you will 
on the, you, that you agree with this, that if you are a, a news organization, your responsibility should be to cover the full community and look for your blind spots, what communities are being undercover and look at how you cover the, uh, the, the, the areas that you do cover. Um, are there any questions about that, about diversity in, in newsroom? Because I do believe that this also is linked to trust because um, the poor coverage that you find of some uh, um, communities of coverage doesn't make you wanna trust the news organizations that are, are publishing that. Somebody comes to you and say, hey, I'm looking for a comment for my story on blah, blah, blah. And you think about how they covered um, or, or didn't cover a story in your own community and you may not trust them. That's a real thing. That's something that's happening. So we need to do a better job at doing that. Um, any questions regarding diversity? Page. Page. Yes. yes, hello. I was wondering if you had ever applied the Casper project to a community of color and found more so the community of color's issue is, I mean, yes, uh, misrepresented news, but how the people of color are being covered. Well, I only did the project in Casper, um, but the the audience that we have, the participants that we had had was pretty diverse. Uh, even though Casper is like, I don't know, 94% white, or maybe it's even higher than that, we had, um, um, we had, of the 34 people, was it 34 or 36, whatever it was, um, there was one African-American woman in it. Uh, as I mentioned, there was this uh, a woman, one woman who was in her 20s uh, representing you know, youth. And we had a gay couple in the group. And um, well, there was, that's some ways that the group was, was diverse. Now, there were more people who identified as conservative in a group than there were liberals, but the liberals were not without complaints about the media. The, the liberals complained about one of the things that I'm talking about is how certain communities are covered. The guy in, in the gay couple, well, they both were part of the group, but one guy said, you know, I don't even go to certain um, media because I know that I'm not represented in that media. So there was some uh, publication that he said that he, um, that he goes to to find information relevant to his community, right? Um, there was uh, another woman who said, it was the uh, African-American woman who said, her complaint was, you know, there are, um, there was some killings of, uh, indigenous women, it happened a lot. Um, and there was, you know, ba barely any coverage of it. And in particular, there was a young girl from an indigenous community who was kidnapped for, you know, several months. And she compared that to coverage of a young white girl who was kidnapped for several months and how the coverage was very, very different. You know, it was national and people all over the country were, uh, or news organizations all over the country were running these stories. And she said, this other girl from the indigenous community didn't get any kind of coverage like that. And that's a real problem. Um, there was, I think there was another, I can't remember, but but my my point is that there were, issues of um, that came up with the, the liberals who are in the group and some of them complain that their coverage, their, their communities, what they consider their communities were not being adequately, adequately covered. Anything else on diversity or even uh, coverage of uh, conservatives and conservative views? Okay, so I'm still using my cell phone instead of my computer. And I had planned to show you a 
video. Um, it was from 60 Minutes that aired uh, maybe about a month, month and a half ago. And it was, um, I wanted to see if you could find anything in it that you found to be unethical about the coverage in that video. Um, I'll try to describe it, but unfortunately I'm not gonna be as, you know, it's not gonna be the same as having the video. But what it was is that the um, 60 Minutes did a report on the rollout of the uh, COVID vaccine in the state of Florida. The premise of the story was that wealthier communities were able to get a vaccine before poorer communities. And one of the problems with that, or one of the issues with that is that um, COVID, the virus was inflicting uh, African-American communities disproportionately, right? At far greater rates, but they were not, and they were um, not, you know, they were in, in they were not, the, the white, the white communities basically were in the front of the line over other people, even those that, where the, where the virus was more um, uh, prevalent. They actually did a pretty good job telling that story. But then they veered into another topic. It's you know, related sort of, but it was about or, uh, a donation that the Publix supermarket chain and Publix is the largest supermarket chain in Florida and I think it's based in Florida. Um, well, Publix gave a uh, $100,000 in donations to the political uh, action committee of, of Governor uh, DeSantis, right? And Publix also was um, allowed to be the uh, primary administer of the vaccine. I mean, along with you know CVS and Walgreens, but uh, Publix played a, a, a big role in vaccinating um, the citizens of Florida. The uh, reporter implied that there was a connection between the donation. Now, you may know, or if you don't, let me tell you now, big corporations give money to politicians. They give a lot of money to politicians. Um, sometimes they give to politicians uh, who are running against each other. That's how this game has evolved to be played. It is not unusual for the of one of the biggest companies in Florida to donate money to the campaign of the incumbent governor, right? But they, um, what they did in the 60 Minutes report, the, the, um, the reporter actually said to Governor DeSantis, how is that not pay for play? Which is the term they use for, um, you know, a quid pro quo. You know, they get, you know, something for something is what that, uh, what that, um, what that means. Um, and so the the problem. Can you still see me? I disappeared. Okay. Um, so the problem with with what happened is that the report did not, um, it did not, uh, there was no evidence that was presented of a uh, pay for play or quid pro quo. It was just something raised by the report. And that's not something that you do in journalism. It's not something that you do in journalism. And that, now, maybe, Maybe it was true. We don't know that. But what we do know is that the that 60 minutes did not provide any evidence of it. And that's what you don't do in, in journalism. Um, so 60 minutes was pretty much scolded by the industry for how they handled that, that story. They stuck by it, uh, believe it or not. So I wanted to show you that video and to see if you could figure out what was the um, 
what was the ethical problem with it, but there, I just described it. So know that you cannot accuse somebody of something without having any evidence that you put in your story. You know, if they had any evidence, it needed to be in the story. Any questions about that? I thought I saw some people who had questions now about that or anything else before I go on. Okay. Yeah, I keep going in and out, um, but I'm glad you're still there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Were you, were you able to, um, I was looking for the video when I got knocked off again. Um, were you able to describe it sufficiently or send me a link and I can try to, or um, David, can well, try to get it on? The, the thing David is, I, one of us to play it. Um, if you can find the link, I mean, I did have the link, but I had to subscribe to Paramount to do it. Um, so if you want to, you can do that. But I, I, I think that I, I um, described it, but, and I also took away the, you know, the interaction of hearing, you know, the, you know, the interns uh, try to identify the problem. I've already given them the answer as to what it was all right Great. so um but has anybody indicated any questions i can't see anybody I, Not I, don't, I don't see anyone i don't see any hands raised okay i mentioned the code of ethics earlier now spj has one but also many newsrooms have their own some follow hours some draft of their own but these are some guidelines and i just want to to read a couple of them, and we're gonna talk about another, um, another case. Um, the way that the code of, the SPJ code of ethics is laid out is that it has uh, four broad principles. One is seek the truth and report it. And there are several um, bullets under that that give specific um, guidance. The other is minimize harm, uh, act independently, and be accountable and transparent. Now, I wrote a story for um, SPJ's magazine, which is called Quill, about Governor DeSantis. And I found about five or six, um, five or six bullets within the SPJ Code of Ethics that 60 Minutes violated. Uh, the very first one on the Seek the Truth and Report It is take responsibility for the accuracy Journalists take the responsibility for the accuracy of their work, verify information before releasing it, use original sources whenever possible. Uh, journalists remember that neither speed nor format excuses inaccuracy. Provide context, take special care not to misrepresent or oversimplify in promoting, previewing, or summarizing a story. Um, then under minimize harm, and I can give you an example of minimize harm. Since last summer, when there were protests sweeping the country, there was some debate within the journalism um, industry about whether you should show the faces of protesters, some of whom had claimed that they had been targeted by either white supremacists or other people who did not like that they were out there protesting. And so some news organizations say, uh, decided that they would, um, they would like either blur the faces of some of the protesters. Although you don't, if you are, there's no re legal reason to do that. You know, if a person is in public um, at a public event, there is no expectation of privacy when you are in public. So this is a judgment that a news organization has to make as to whether or not they want to um, not show the faces of, of protesters. Some of them um, decide that they would because they asserted, you know, as journalists, we should be um, showing what's going on and we shouldn't be editing things out. Um, so that is still um, a debate. 
Uh, I think SPJ seems to be more on the side of uh, blurring uh, or, or not showing the faces of, of protesters. You taking pictures from a wide angle or um, you know, just getting so far away that you can't identify anybody or shooting pictures in a way that, that uh, people's faces are not revealed. I was on a um, radio, I was interviewed on, by a radio station yesterday and somebody brought up the issue of how certain images on TV um, may be disturbing to people. And, and, and as a result, some news organizations are responding by, they'll give you a warning, what we're about to show is graphic. So you may wanna, you know, step away or turn off the, you know, or, or, or something. I've heard this on the radio as well. And with all the video that's been surfacing of, of uh, people being killed by police, some news organization, broadcast news organizations have, um, even though they have the video of the person being shot, they freeze it just before, you know, the per just before the image would show the person actually being struck by a bullet in the aftermath. These all fall under the category of uh, minimized harm. It says to journalists should balance the public's need for information against potential harm or discomfort. Pursuit of the news is not a license for arrogance or undue intrusiveness. Uh, show compassion for those who may be affected by news coverage. Use heightened sensitivity when dealing with uh, juveniles, victims of uh, sex crimes, and sources of subjects who are inexperienced or unable to give consent. Consider cultural differences in approach and treatment. Uh, another one, recognize that legal access to information uh, differs from an ethical justification to publish or broadcast it. And this was also one that uh, came up during coverage of the protests and, and um, George Floyd coverage. Realize that private people have a greater right to control information about themselves than public figures and others who seek power, influence, or attention. Weigh the consequences of publishing or broadcasting personal information. Also, avoid pandering to lyric curiosity, even if others do so. Um, and I'm gonna mention one, the other one on the act independently. It says, avoid conflicts of interest, real or perceived. The disclose unavoidable conflicts. Now I want to talk about this one for a moment because I also had a picture of the Cuomo brothers that I was going to show you today. Um, um, Andrew Cuomo is the governor of the state of New York and Chris Cuomo is a news anchor on CNN. Um, uh, CNN did coverage just like every other news organization of the pandemic. And when Governor Cuomo was having his daily press, press conferences, you know, they showed some of them live. Uh, Chris Cuomo actually interviewed his brother. And they would have this like banter going back and forth about tell mom I said hi or how's mom doing today. I think that this was totally inappropriate. You know, and Chris has recently said that, you know, when involves in his family, there's a conflict. Well, yeah, I think that's correct. And I think that's why CNN never should have allowed Chris Cuomo to interview his brother. Even though the, his governor is the governor of uh, New York, there are other journalists who can do that. Um, I think the most ethical way to handle this is to let anybody else do the coverage of the governor and not his brother. Um, and, and what was further wrong about this, or you know, well, some people think it was wrong, is that Chris Cuomo, who is an attorney, I mean, he has a, a law degree, was advising his brother. That's not the part that bothers me so much as the other part, which is 
he was in on strategy sessions with other members of um, of uh, Cuomo's circle, whether you know people employed by the government or friends of his or whatever. But he was involved in strategy sessions on how uh, the governor should respond to allegations of uh, sexual harassment that had been leveled against him by many women. You know, that was, you don't, I don't care who you are, you don't get on a phone call with a bunch of other people who are advising the governor if you are a journalist. You just don't do that. Now, the other part of this about giving advice, um, and I think this is important to say, um, as his, you, you, Chris, Chris Cuomo and Andrew Cuomo will for, forever be brothers. And brothers have, you know, a relationship. <laughs> They're related, right? Um, I don't think that your job should keep you from interacting with your brother, right? And even, I would even go as far as say, if he wanted to give some one-on-one -on -one counsel to his brother, then that may have even been okay too. But in my view, crossing the line is when you become a part of the team. This is not brother to brother. This is you are a member of the machinery that is trying to advise the governor. I, I hope that you can see the distinction that I'm making here. And, and by the way, I, I will point out that um, there are others who think that even the brother on brother counsel is inappropriate, even if it's one on one. Um, so I'm interested to hear what you think about that. But what we all agree on is that the strategy sessions, him being a participant, you know, not an ethical thing to do. Interviewing your brother on TV, um, not a good thing to do or even having anything to do with any coverage of a relative. It's just not appropriate. Um, I wanna hear what you guys think about this. Have you heard about this? Uh, and, and what are your thoughts? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? What, what do you have to say? Can somebody call on people who raise their hand? Lily? Um, I actually have a real life question that just came to mind. Mm -hmm. So um, my hometown is doing a pride event this June and I am, I've been helping plan it. And I was thinking about going to the press and asking them to cover it. So should I ask for somebody else to write a story about it rather than me, since I'm technically on the committee and have been helping? So um, let me understand this. You are on. You're on the committee for the this proud event. Yes. Well, are it's you an official committee, but yes, I've been helping plan it. Okay, and you also are are a journalist. You, yes. Okay. Um, let me see what other. I'm curious to hear what other people say. Uh, call on somebody who raised their hand to see what they say. What would their what What was your name again? Lily. Sloan. What do other th others think Lily should do? All right. Um, hi, Lily. Hi, Mr. Hicks. My name is Sloan. Um, I don't think you should cover it, in my opinion. I think that, um, like, it's good. Like, it's good that you're on the board. But I think because you're on the board, you you intrinsically have, like, a, I mean, like, a. of course, like, no one's going to cover and be like, oh, this is a horrible event. You know what I mean? But you do have like, uh, like, that's your event. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so I just think you should get someone else to cover it. I like how you pointed that out, like not a bias, but I'm coming into it like that. So I like how you pointed that out. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think uh, in regards to like Chris, uh, Chris Cuomo and all that, I like I learned in in college on day one. You don't interview friends. You don't interview family. Um, when you're a part of something, you you don't cover it. You know what I mean? So I think it is, they are getting a pass because of like their power. They're getting a pass because who they are. They're getting a pass because of their their legacy. And I think that's really unfair. You know, I think that's, uh, it's, it's just weird. I have, you know, I think uh, the degree of power they have, they should, 
you know, they should know better. <laughs> so I just think it's a, it's inappropriate, honestly, especially given this time where this is a serious time where he's having serious allegations. There's a lot of important information that quite frankly, his brother should not be a part of this conversation, you know? So that's okay. my opinion. All right. I saw that there were some other hands. What else does somebody have to say on these maps? Madison? Regarding the Cuomo's, um, yeah, like I, when it was all happening, like when they were interviewing each other and like, you know, talking about their families and everything, I didn't think too much of it just because it was so entertaining to watch. But like now- yes, that's the thing. Up, yeah, exactly. That's like they were clearly just doing it like to get the views and everything. So right. from a standpoint, I guess <laughs> that's a good thing, but yeah, like I would never go interview one of my, one of my family members and like, you could definitely get around in other ways. Like someone else could interview, um, governor Cuomo and stuff like that. Like he didn't have to like be so close to it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I remember people raised that issue with Oprah and Gail, right? When mm -hmm. Gail would do an interview and she would have Oprah come on and, you know, it was just, again, for, for the views, I'm sure, but they're best friends. Like, how can you interview your best friend? Do you know that Nina Totenberg at NPR was good friends with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, yet she covered the Supreme Court? Wow. Now yeah. I didn't know that. And, uh, you know, and after um, Justice Ginsburg died, you know, NPR interviewed Nina Totenberg and they talked about this as if it wasn't a problem. And like, mm -hmm. get that close to a source, you know, I mean, so yeah, there, there are examples of it, of, of it out there. Who else has something to say on this? Wasn't there some others? Uh, Mary? Hello, I'm Mary, and I was wondering if you could explain at what level, um, so like if you talk to a source a lot, because say you're from a small area and that is the person that you need to talk to for that story, at what level should you stop going to them because you have formed kind of a relationship with them? I'm sorry, Mary, you're saying at what point do you recognize that you shouldn't be covering somebody that you're close to? Yeah. Um, when you have to, when you have to do a story about them, if they do something okay. newsworthy, you should avoid it. You should not. Can I rephrase? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So say you're covering health and you need to talk to someone at the health department and you cover health often. So you're reaching out to this particular source often. Um, is there a point where you have too much of a relationship and you're always talking to them where you should say someone else needs to do this instead of me? Well, if you become friends and start dating and all of that, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't <laughs> for that person. I mean, there are other people who are in the health field that you can talk to, but if it's a professional relationship, just because you talk to them frequently shouldn't, um, you know, prevent you from continuing to go to them as a source, if it's a professional relationship. Okay, thank you. All right, Kaylee. Hi, um, going back to the Cuomo brothers, I think that uh, all of the behavior between them kind of really threatened CNN's credibility and continuing to have Chris Cuomo as an employee could is just really problematic because of everything that he's taken from his brother and done with his brother. Like he also, I think, got tests and maybe some other stuff like early on in the pandemic that like from his brother that were not um, distributed where they normally would have gone because of that privilege. He got so, to the front of the line too, it's the allegation, right? Yeah, yeah. So I just think that I don't think he should still be employed at CNN if CNN wants to have the trust of viewers like when the same project that you did, I think mm -hmm. that completely undermines the trust. I think that you are absolutely right about that because credibility is like the major currency that any news organization has. You know, the reason that 
that people go to you is because they trust what you're saying, you know? And when you repeatedly um, breach the trust that you have with, the, the, with your, your, um, your followers, your news, your news consumers who, who seek you out, they may leave and not come back. And then that's, that's not even to mention the people who have this general distrust of the media already. And it's very easy for them to say that CNN is typical of all media and that every other news organization will have done the same thing. So my point is that you don't just harm your own credibility as a news organization. You harm the credibility of every other news organization because people just lump us all together and they're not discerning about you know who's who. It's like, you're all the media. We have a few more minutes. Um... Any other questions? I have one that I wanted to ask, and um, but I'll wait if there's some other, if, if students have questions. I don't wanna hog the time we have left. Okay, anybody else? I have one question. It's about diversity. Okay. It is how can newsrooms make and encourage diversity without making it appear like a quota like we have one person of um who's asian and one person who's black and one person who can speak on the lgbtq issues or because they're queer or something of that sort you mean um these are people who are on staff right yes yes yeah, yeah. hey you know what that is a very good question because um i think people do view that i've heard that in uh, uh in newsrooms where i've worked it's like all right, well, we've already got an Asian guy. What, why are we going out of our way to hire a second Asian guy, you know? Um, but what I don't see, what I never heard was, we already have a white guy. Why don't we go out of, why are we going out of our way to hire another white guy? Um, I think that it's important for newsrooms to explain to their staffs what they're doing and why, because it's not, all about just getting a certain number of people. It is about covering the community better. That's really what it's all about. Um, and so, for example, uh, an example that I gave about the, um, the women in Atlanta who were killed, the Asian women, women of Asian descent. Um, some of the people there spoke um, Chinese and I think others spoke Korean, right? Is that what it was? But in a way, you know, there were news organizations were hard to find people who could even communicate with um, sources, with potential sources, right? So that's the kind of thing that, that leads to. And back during the time of the riots uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, that, that the Kerner Commission tried to address. There were um, news organizations were sending black people, newspapers were sending black people who worked in the building. They weren't, they didn't have journalism jobs. It's just that they were sent because they were black, because they didn't have any black people who could go into the community. Um, but the, the short answer to your, your question is that newsrooms, the management, should explain the reason for their focus on diversity. And that explanation should include that it's about improving coverage to make sure that um, there is a diversity of uh, thought, diversity of ideas, people who come who have different experiences and people who know the different communities. All of that leads to better coverage of the community. Yeah, I think um, that's somewhat related to the question I have, which was, you know, it's kind of a fine line between wanting to feel like you bring something unique because of your background, because of your religion or whatever, nationality, right. and wanting to feel like you're bringing that uniqueness, but also feeling like your news organization only sees you as that or only will use you for those kind of stories, or you know, that's the only expertise that you have. 
So it's like, how do you not, you know, because I've heard um, African American reporters say, I don't want to do the black beat. You know, I don't want to be the only reporter covering African American issues or race issues. Um, and some of them will specifically try not to get assigned to that beat because they feel like they get pigeonholed as that's the only thing you, that's the only specialty you have basically is your race. Right. Um, I have heard that before as well. Um, one of the things that we're gonna do, Shirley at SPJ, we are planning a, um, a session probably either in late July, I mean, late June or, or mid July early to mid July, early, late June to mid, mid July <laughs> on um, retention. Um, because there is some thought that when a person of color is recruited and hired as an organization, and then they leave in a year or two, that they got, um, you know, they, they, you know, they, they saw an opportunity to get, to go to a bigger, better place and make more money. What is more often the truth is that they leave because um, of how they're treated there, what the environment is like, what the culture is like, you know, how other people relate to them, how they don't get invited to things. So it's not, it's not just about, you know, it's, it's not about how, how, you know, it's not about, they don't, the reason that um, many, I'm tempted to say most, start looking for another job is that there's something cultural there that they feel like they're not a good fit or there's a person there or there's some people there. So it's, it's equally important that once you get um, people in the newsroom that they are nurtured and that you listen to them because a lot sometimes they say, well, you know, nobody, you know, I, none of my ideas got accepted. You know, one of the things that people from diverse backgrounds bringing, and this is all types of diversity, is a viewpoint and a lived experience that others may not have. That's a valuable thing for any news organization to have. And when they speak, what you shouldn't do is say, no, I don't have that experience, so it's not valid, you know, or that's not the traditional way that we do things. You know, there is value in listening to people who are different than you. And that needs to be explained to the staff and the, you know, the management needs to understand that because sometimes they don't. All right. Any last comments, questions for Rod Hicks? Gemma? No, sorry, I meant to hit the clock emoji. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I don't see any. Let me just do a quick scan. Marissa, is that your hand? Yeah, um, I was just wondering uh, what recommendations do you have when we are covering a community that may not be our own? And how, you know how what? do we best represent that community? Hey, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, Shirley, mm -hmm. can I send to you something for you to distribute to uh, to the um, to the interns? There is sure. a there's a professor at uh, uh, what is it, the University of Wisconsin in Madison? Is that the name of a place? Um, she put together a pretty detailed um, list of of uh, things that you. She talked about just making it a point to go into communities, not not to go to the usual suspects. It's like you know what, I haven't. I haven't talked to people in this community. I'm gonna go there. Uh, you know, I'm gonna find somebody there. And she talks about how to um, how to introduce yourself when you go into these communities, how to, to talk, what to look for. It's a very detailed um, list. It's like four pages or something like that, but it's bullet points, so it's easy to read. Um, so 
I'm going to uh, send that to Shirley to be distributed to to everybody. Okay, and and that will that will answer your question, and it will be much better than anything that I could say right now. Okay, I'd be happy to distribute it. Um, Paul Glader mentioned the importance of geographic diversity, not just uh, race and ethnicity and gender. And yeah, we've been looking at that actually in the Dow Jones News Fund program because we do tend to draw from the coast, right? East Coast, West Coast, uh, some in the South, but we definitely have uh, most of our, as Paul says, most of the national media is, you know, kind of mid-Atlantic and up. So I have to think about diversity in all forms. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Rod, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you. Thanks for hanging in there through the technical difficulties and um, being so generous with your time and, and answering every question. Um, and I would ask the students to please uh, show some appreciation to Rod Hicks and uh, Rod who gives out your info or are you more like, uh, you know, catch me on Twitter, I might respond to you. Uh, if students yeah. have questions or if they want to uh, follow up on things. Yeah, I will send you my contact information as well, but you can reach me on Twitter at Rod Hicks. Okay, great. All right, thank you guys for hanging in there. I know it's been a long day for some of you and um, I will catch you tomorrow. We have uh, Krisa Thompson coming tomorrow to talk about oh, sourcing great. and we'll probably great. Come cover some of these same issues about diversity and sourcing as well, so. I had, a, I had a conversation with her after I got this position. You know, she's really yeah. good. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. If there's nothing else, good night. Good night. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, great. That was good. I I, I had <laughs> unbelievable technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs>